In this video, we want to talk about the invertibility of a transformation from the perspective of the transformation expressed as a matrix vector product. So remember that in the past, that if we had some transformation, and we'll just call it T, we said that if T is a linear transformation, then we can always express it as a matrix vector product. So let's say that T is transforming vectors X, then we could always write that as maybe this matrix A times the vector X. So we're just expressing the transformation in terms of the product of a matrix by a vector. And oftentimes we would call the matrix A the transformation matrix because it's the matrix that we multiply by any vector in order to apply the transformation to that vector. The point we want to make now is that when we're thinking about the transformation as a matrix vector product, so we're picturing it as this A times the vector X, the dimensions of A can tell us about the invertibility of the transformation. And we're going to go into detail about why, but the point we want to make here is that T can only be invertible when the matrix A is a square matrix. In conjunction with that, we also know, based on this fact, that the transformation is only invertible when the transformation maps from Rn space to Rn space. In other words, n can be any value, but we have to be mapping within the same space. So we have to map from R2 to R2, or R3 to R3, or R4 to R4. If we're mapping across spaces from R3 to R2, for example, then we know immediately that the transformation is not invertible. And these two facts here, that we're mapping within the same space, and that t can only be invertible when a is square, they make sense together. Because if we think about this matrix A times the vector x, the matrix vector product, we said that A has to be square. So let's do a little dimensional analysis and imagine that A is a 3 by 3 matrix, for example. If we're multiplying a 3 by 3 matrix by some vector x, we know right away that that vector x has to have three rows. Because remember, in order for matrix multiplication to be defined, these two numbers have to match. So we know that the vector x has to have three rows, and of course, because it's a vector, we have to express it as a single column matrix or a single row matrix. So if it's got three rows, it has to have one column, which means then that the result here is going to be given by these dimensions here, these outside dimensions, so the dimensions of the result are going to be a 3 by 1 column matrix. And notice here that we've got this transformation matrix A. We're multiplying it by a 3 by 1 vector x, and we're getting a 3 by 1 vector as a result, which means that we're transforming a vector that's in R3 space. A 3 component vector is in R3 space, and we're getting out a three component vector, which is also an R3 space. So if we're saying that A is a square matrix, then by definition, based on the dimensions of matrix multiplication and how that has to work out, that tells us that we can only be transforming from the same space to the same space. We have to be transforming within the same space. And of course, we could work backwards if we started with this fact that we're transforming within the same space. We could give this example here of, okay, we're starting with a three by one vector and a 3 by 1 vector and work backwards to get the dimensions of the matrix and we would see every time that the matrix was square and it would have the dimensions given by this value right here. So if that were a 3, the dimensions of the matrix would be 3 by 3. If this were a 2, the dimensions of the matrix would be 2 by 2. So we can work backwards the other way too, but either way, these two facts go together. So we know that if the transformation T is going to be invertible, A has to be square and the transformation has to occur within the same space, not across spaces. And here's the way that we can prove that to ourselves. So let's say that we're given some non-square matrix, some rectangular matrix A, and let's say A looks like this. So we'll say the rectangular matrix 3, 1, 0, 0, 2, and negative 2. What we're going to do is use the null and column spaces of a matrix to show this. But we'll start with this rectangular matrix. Notice that it's wider than it is tall. It has more columns than it does rows. The first thing we want to do is put this into reduced row echelon form. When we do that, we'll divide through the first row by 3, and we'll get 1, 1 third, 0, and then 0, 2, negative 2. And then we'll go ahead and find the pivot entry 
in the second row here where this 2 is. We'll do that by dividing through the second row by 2. So we'll get 1, 1 third, 0, and then 0, 1, negative 1. And then we'll go ahead and zero out this 1 third entry to get this in reduced row echelon form. So we'll take 1 third times the second row and subtract that result from the first row. And so our final matrix then will be 1 third times 0 is 0, 1 minus 0 is 1, 1 third times 1 is 1 third, 1 third minus 1 third is 0, 1 third times negative 1 third is a negative 1 third, 0 minus a negative 1 third is 0 plus 1 third or one third. And then in the last row, 0, 1, negative 1. Now with this matrix in reduced row echelon form, here's what we realize. If we were trying to find the null space of this matrix, what we would have done is we would have taken this reduced row echelon form matrix and augmented it with the zero matrix. Because to find the null space, we're saying if we multiply this matrix by a vector x and get the zero matrix, that gives us the null space. We're trying to find the vectors x. So we augment this matrix with the zero matrix, and that'll allow us to solve for values of x. So if we go ahead and do that augmenting, we get 1, 0, 1 third, 0, 1, negative 1, and then we'll augment with the zero matrix. And then what this tells us here, if we look at these components, we have two pivot columns for x1 and x2, the components of this vector x here, and then we have a free column for x3. And so if we write a vector equation, a linear combination solution here, we get the solution x1, x2, x3 is equal to our one free variable, which is x3. And we have that multiplied by negative one third, by positive one, and then by one. What this equation tells us is that the null space of this matrix A here is given by the span of this vector we just found, negative 1 third, 1, 1. So the span of this vector defines the null space. What that tells me is that any scalar multiple of this vector maps to the zero vector. In other words, I could take this vector, negative 1 third, 1, 1, and plug it in here for x, and I'll get the zero vector. Or I could take any other scalar multiple of this vector, plug it in here for x, and I would get the zero vector, which means I have several vectors all mapping to the zero vector. I'm saying that negative 1 third, 1, 1 maps to the zero vector. Again, if I took any scalar multiple, so let's say we multiply this by 2, I would say that negative 2 thirds, 2, 2, maps to the zero vector. Of course, we know that the zero vector maps to the zero vector. If I plug in the zero vector here for x, I'm going to get the zero vector. So all three of these vectors, and many more, any other scalar multiple of this vector here, all map to the zero vector. And what do we know when we say that we have multiple vectors mapping to one vector? We say that the transformation is not injective. It's not one-to-one. -one. We don't have that unique relationship, and so we have a relationship that is not injective. So this matrix A here, which remember represents the matrix A in this transformation, we're just saying that the transformation can be represented by this matrix vector product. Well, this matrix here is showing us that multiple values of x, different values of x, all result in the same vector. So the transformation T is not injective when our matrix looks like this. And this is actually always going to be the case when you have a rectangular matrix that's wider than it is tall. So remember we say that a matrix A always has M by N dimensions, where M is the rows and N is the columns. So when you have more columns than you do rows, when N is greater than M, the transformation is not injective. The reason is because when we go to put the matrix into reduced row echelon form, we can only get one pivot in every row. So eventually we're going to run out of rows where we can find pivots and we're going to be left with some columns at the end of the matrix, some columns here on the right side of the matrix that don't have a pivot entry, which means that when we go to find this null space, 
we're going to have this column or columns at the end that are free columns that are going to come into this equation and give us this vector which is in the null space of the matrix A. And so we're going to know right away that there are vectors in the null space other than just the zero vector. And because then there are multiple vectors in the null space, we're going to have this relationship where multiple vectors are mapping to the zero vector, which is not an injective relationship. So if you have a matrix with more columns than rows, and that matrix is representing the transformation as the matrix vector product, then you know that the transformation is not injective. And then we can do a really similar thing to show that the transformation is not surjective when the matrix is rectangular, but it's taller than it is wide. So let's say, for instance, that we're given a different matrix. We'll take this same matrix A, but we'll call it B, and we'll just make it taller. So let's say it is the matrix 3, 1, 0, and then 0, 2, negative 2. If we put this matrix in reduced row echelon form, let's go ahead and swap the first and second rows so that we end up with that pivot of 1, 3, 0, 0, negative 2. And then let's go ahead and subtract 3 of the first row from the second row. When we do that, we'll get 3 times 1 is 3, 3 minus 3 is 0, and then we'll get 3 times 2 is 6, 0 minus 6 is a negative 6, 0 and negative 2. Then we'll multiply through the second row by a negative 1 sixth to get a 1 there in that pivot position. So we'll get 1, 2, 0, 1, 0, negative 2. And then we can zero out the rest of the second column. So we'll take two of the second row away from the first row, and we'll get 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, negative 2. And then we will add two of the second row to the third row, and the result will be 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And here's how you know right away that you're going to have a problem with the transformation not being surjective. If we think about this matrix in terms of its column space, the column space of B is given by the span of these column vectors. So we'll say the span of the column vectors 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0, these columns from the matrix B. Well, notice here that we have two vectors that are in three dimensions because they each have three components. So these two vectors are sitting in R3 but we only have two of them. Well, in R3 space, if you imagine R3, we've got three dimensions, but with two vectors, the only thing we can ever do is form a plane in R3, which means that any vector in R3 space that is not sitting in the plane, for example, this vector, we can't get to that vector with just these two right here. In R3 space, when you only have two vectors, those two vectors, the most they can ever span is a plane. They can't span all of R3 space. To span all of R3 space, you need three vectors. To span all of R4 space, you need four vectors. To span all of Rn space, you need n vectors. We only have two vectors in three dimensions. We can only span a plane. We can't span all of R3, which means that there's going to be a bunch of vectors here in three-dimensional space that we can't map to using a combination, using a linear combination of these columns. So remember, going back to our surjective injective discussion, if we have a bunch of vectors in A and then a bunch of vectors in B, we said that in order for the transformation to be surjective, every B had to get mapped to. But what we're saying here is that there are some vectors that can't possibly get mapped to which means that we're going to be missing out on some B. This B might not get mapped to because it's one of these yellow vectors. It doesn't sit in the plane. So we don't have a way to map to every vector B, which means that whenever you start with a matrix here that is rectangular, where again, if this is M by N or rows by columns, whenever you have more rows than columns, whenever M is greater than n, you're going to have a problem 
with the transformation being surjective. The transformation cannot be surjective when you have more rows than columns because you'll always end up with too few columns for the space that you're spanning. And in the same way, when you have a rectangular matrix and you have more columns than rows, you'll always end up with multiple vectors in the null space that are all mapping to the zero vector and you'll have a transformation that's not injective. So this tells you not surjective, the null space tells you not injective. And so the conclusion then is that if you have a rectangular matrix, a matrix that's not square, you're always gonna have a problem with the transformation either being not injective or not surjective. And if you ever have a problem with either one of those, you know right away that the transformation is not invertible. So based on all this math we did, this tells us that the only possible way for the transformation to be invertible is what we said at the beginning. When we represent that transformation as a matrix vector product, that matrix has to be square. If it's square, there's a chance the transformation is invertible. It's not invertible every single time, but it can be invertible. But if the matrix A is rectangular, either with more columns than rows or with more rows than columns, we know right away that there's no possible way for the transformation to be invertible.